The seventh most common question, or the seventh misconception in Islam, in the minds of non-Muslim is that why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her behind the wheel? Why does Islam subjugate the woman by keeping her in hijab? Before I discuss the reason of hijab, let us analyze what was the status of the woman in the past civilizations. When we read the history of Babylonian civilization, it says that women were ill-treated. And if a man committed murder, his wife was put to death. This was the law. If you read the history of the Greek civilization, known as a very great civilization, at that time, they believed in an imaginary woman by the name of Pandora, who was the cause of all the evil in the society. In that great Greek civilization, women were used for sex and pleasure. Prostitution was common. When you read the history of Roman civilization, even in Roman civilization, the women were looked down upon. Nudity and prostitution was common. When we read the history of Egyptian civilization, the woman was considered as an evil, and she was called as an instrument of the devil. When we read the history of Arab civilization, before Quran was revealed, the Arabs, very often, they buried the female alive after she was born. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. After the revelation of the Quran, this evil practice has stopped, but yet it persists in other parts of the world. Islam, alhamdulillah, uplifted the woman. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the major benefactor in giving the rights to the woman. And after Islam has given rights to the woman, it has even shown us a way how that woman should maintain her status. Hijab has been prescribed to the woman so that she maintains the status and doesn't go back to the old days. Normally, people talk about hijab for the woman, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then speaks about the hijab for the woman. Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, if any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes, he should lower his case. This is what the Quran says. Once, there was a Muslim man who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? This is haram in Islam. He told me, our beloved prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited, I have not completed half my glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean when he said, the first glance is forgiven, second is prohibited? What the Prophet meant was that if you unintentionally look at a woman, don't look at her again. That does not mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. The next verse of Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 31, speaks about the hijab for the woman. That whenever a woman looks at a man, and if any breath and thought comes, she should lower her gaze. There are basically six criteria for hijab given in the glorious Quran and Hadith regarding the clothing of hijab. The first is the extent. As far as for the man is concerned, the extent is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria for the man and the woman are the same. The second is the clothes they wear, they should be loose. It should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the figure. The third, it should not be transparent or translucent so that a person can see through it. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. These are basically the six criteria for hijab regarding clothing, but this does not constitute the complete hijab. The complete hijab besides the hijab of the clothing also includes the behavior, the conduct, the attitude, as well as the intention of the person. Besides the hijab of the clothing, there's hijab of the eyes, hijab of the heart, hijab of the mind, hijab of the thought. 
It even includes the way a person talks, the way a person walks, the way a person behaves. This is the complete hijab. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak, they should put on the jilbab, so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Quran says, hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. I'd like to ask you a question. That suppose two twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful, if they are walking down the streets of Dubai, walking down along the Cornish, and if one twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, the complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist, and the other twin sister, she is wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or shorts. And if both of them are walking down the streets in Dubai, along the Cornish, and if on the side there is a ruffian who is waiting for a catch, who is waiting to tease a girl, I am asking the question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? Or will it tease the girl wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or short? Which girl will it tease? Which girl? But natural, the girl wearing the Western clothes, the mini skirts or short. If you are inviting, then you will receive. The Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed to prevent the woman from being molested. And after this, if anyone rapes any woman, the Islamic Sharia says, death penalty. Many non-Muslims will say, death penalty? In this age of 21st century, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless law. But when I ask this question, and I've asked this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that suppose, God forbid, someone rapes your mother, or someone rapes your sister, and if you are made the judge, and the rapist is bought in front of you, what punishment will you give him? Believe me, all of them said, 100%, we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. So someone rapes your mother, your wife, your sister, you want to put him to death. Someone rapes somebody else's mother, somebody else's sister, you say, death penalty, barbaric law. Why these double standards? Why? And do you know, America, USA, which happens to be the most advanced country in the world. Do you know it has one of the highest rates of rape in the world? The country which has one of the highest rate of rape in the world is USA. According to the FBI statistics of 1990, every day, 1,756 cases of rape took place. According to the statistics of US Department of Justice, in 1996, every day, 2,713 cases of rape took place. 1990, 1,756. 1996, 2,713. Maybe the Americans got bold, bolder. In six years' time, they got more bold. If you calculate every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in America. You know, we are here in this auditorium for the past one and a half hour. Already 150 rapes may have taken place in USA till the time we are here. I am asking you the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia, any man looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. The woman should be modestly dressed, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist. And after that, any man rapes any woman, capital punishment, death penalty. I'm asking you the question, will the rate of rape in America, will it increase, will it remain the same, or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia, you get results. That's the reason the least rate of rape in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. You implement the Sharia, you get results. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman when it speaks about women's liberalization, it's nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, deprivation of a soul, and degradation of honor. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubines, butterflies, and mistresses, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketers hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. In the name of art and culture, 
The Westerners, they're selling their daughters. They're selling their mothers. And you see it very common. In most of the ads, invariably, you have to find a woman. You see an ad of a motorcycle. How many women ride motorcycle? Yet you see a woman in the ad of motorcycle. In the ad of a car, percentage-wise, a small percentage of women drive cars. Yet you'll find a woman in the ad of a car. And I was told about a very famous advertisement ad of the BMW. You know BMW car? It's in competition with Mercedes. The youngsters, they prefer BMW. It has a better pickup. It is fast. Someone told me in one of the very famous ads of BMW, there was a woman who was standing in front of the car with a bikini and the ad read, test driver now, who, the girl or the car? <laughs> so in the name of women liberalization, they are selling their daughters. They are selling their mothers. We love our daughters. We love our mothers. We love our wives. If the hijab subjugates the woman and protects her, we love this subjugation. We love this subjugation and we love this protection. If this is your freedom in the name of women liberalization, selling your body, selling yourself, we are very happy with our religion. Islam has prescribed women hijab to protect her and to uplift her. And we see today the same thing is happening in the Western world. Same thing what happened in Greek civilization, Roman civilization, women in the name of liberalization, art, culture, modeling, fashion, TV, all this you see, what are they doing? Going back to the old age.